talk is intended for librarians, uh, implementers, and financiers to process design. So we're actually trying to reach a broad audience here. There's other people right now. So as much as I can, I'll make some questions in the middle. I think it's probably best for the class audience to go back to this and talk. If at some point there is, if you think that you really cannot keep on moving on unless I answer questions, please just raise your hand. So, uh, we're going to spend the first part uh, introducing concepts, essentially reviewing some essential um, I, um, ideas about them, uh, sort of helping as a profession for those who have heard about them before, and those who have yet to learn about concepts, I hope that this will be a good enough introduction. And then, in the second part, we're going to talk about the reason why I'm here to begin with concept play. So, our main objective is to implement concepts for C++. Um, we want this to be done in a much more generic fashion, uh, essentially so that we can define an abstract layer for realizing concepts. We need this layer to be independent from alternative designs as well as extensible to alternative designs. We're also hoping that ideas from here can be ported into uh, different uh, domains of implementation of concepts, like the probably different providers and things of the sort. So in doing so, we are hoping to actually be able to completely assess the implications of any given design on the um, implementation as well as the usability of the feature. And we also want to highlight the differences that there may be between um, these alternative designs. So essentially we want to know what is it exactly that sets this particular design uh, apart from this other one. We hope that we can, do, we can be able to do that uh, this way. So we actually try to separate our code as much as we can from that of the implementation of the current world standard. And we also distinguish between two particular layers of implementations here. We have what we call the infrastructure layer, which holds our abstract implementation, and the instantiation layer, which holds design-specific implementations. So concept claim is an implementation of those concepts. <coughs> uh, it is done in claim, and which is a little bit for and for the C family of languages. It is implemented in a more generic fashion, so I talked about separating our code from the similar standard. So we isolate concept plan implementation from that of plan whenever possible. And then we have that distinction between the instantiation and design specific layers. We're currently exploring two uh, main designs. One is based on the version of, well, the draft of the standard right before the committee decided that um, it was probably too early in the process to add concepts um, to the current revision. So that decision came at a meeting in Frankfurt, so we decided to call this pre Frankfurt. Um, the other design is based on <laughs> is based on a recent proposal that was presented in Kona. Um, that one came as a result of a meeting that had occurred in Palo Alto. It was actually a meeting um, organized by Alex Stepanov, the author of uh, Elements of Programming Book, and Matt Jones was there, Sean Perry there. Um, there was John. Oh, he's not here. There was my advisor, um, Andrew Lumsden, Vianne, his first of myself and the rest of our team and some other people. And um, so we designed, we came up with this design and we decided to call it the Pavlanto design, um, just for reason of simplicity. So, um, in addition to these particular designs, we're also trying to support alternative options like the enabling or disabling of implicit or explicit concepts or various ways to deal with concept-based overloading, we try to support those alternatives via some compiler flags. It's currently under development at Indian University, and I have the link there for those who will be interested in getting updated information on the progress in this project. It's still work in progress. <coughs> so we chose to work from Clang for four main reasons. One is the fact that Clang is based on carefully designed coding guidelines. Um, it was really helpful for us. Um, it uses modern C++ implementation technology, which brings us more generalization, highly structured codes, and a lot of techniques that just make our work a lot easier. Um, perhaps the most important reason is the fact that it follows the school standards strictly, or at least it attempts to, in a lot of ways, for reason of code vulnerability. Um, if I'm mistaken, feel free to... Um, and last but not the least, the license that it's based upon it's open source and allows the kind of extensions and, and experimentations that we need. So as a result of all this, we were able to conveniently release a lot of Clang implementation, which brought us things like error detection and diagnosis for free. And we're also hoping that the results that we get from this will be more reliable, given that 
claim is following the standards strictly. There is another comparator for concepts, serious <coughs> concepts out there, that was developed by Doug Greger um, when he was still working for our group. It's called Concept GCC, and it was a prototype for the preframe for design. It was implemented in uh, the GNU compiler for C++, and it differs from uh, concept claim in essentially the base of the population model. Basically, while concept GCC goes from the perspective of treating concepts as class templates, concept claim wants to treat every component of concepts as first class entities of the language. And also, the development of GCC has been on the higher state since 2009. So we're going to start from the way we do these concepts from the perspective of Jeff programming. And, um, well, we'll see. The aim of generic programming can be characterized into these four bullet points. Um, there's actually a much, much, I mean, these bullet points are actually larger paragraphs, but I, I tried to put them in one sentence <coughs> here. So first, we're looking for abstract representations of efficient software components. Efficiency is very important here. Abstraction, even more important. Well, I don't know if more important, but it is as important. And safety is also important. There is a lifting process that goes on here from a variety of concrete algorithms up to some general algorithms. And uh, that lifting process has to preserve the efficiency of the initial concrete algorithms. And also the lifting and the use of genetic algorithms must be, must be safe. The other aim is to express algorithms with minimal assumptions about data structures and data structures with minimal assumptions about algorithms. So basically improving um, the reusability and interoperability and adaptability of our components here. Um, the other thing, there may be times when if we have a certain input, it can actually behave more efficiently than the provided generic uh, implementation. Genetic programming aims at providing specializations for those cases to take advantage of efficiency, of possible efficiency. And also, when we're using genetic components, we may have a choice between different specializations. Um, we want to always pick the most efficient specialization. So I'm going to show some examples, and hopefully <coughs> what I just listed here will make a little bit more sense. So our task is to add numbers that are stored in an array. Um, that's really what we want to do, add numbers that are stored in an array. And in one case, those numbers happen to be integers. In the other case, they're floating point numbers. But we still have to keep these two implementations in different separate um, declarations. Why? Because there is this unnecessary requirement of the types of, of the elements in our arrays. It's unnecessary because it's not really, do, it's not really um, a major part of the idea of summation. So we really would like to express this summation of the elements more concisely. So we basically just want to abstract over the types of the elements in the array. In C++, we do that using templates, and we express the abstraction uh, using the template parameters. Basically, we're saying for any given type T, this is what the summation of the elements in an array of those types would look like. Uh, here, when we write this, there is this requirement that the class operator must be defined appropriately for those types. But then somebody might come along and say, well, I, want to, I have my stuff stored in a, in a list instead, instead of an array. Again, at this point, we have to, put, to abstract over the types of the containers because we really don't want to have implementations. You know, well, we want to express our algorithms more concisely with respect to what the meaning is. So we express the abstraction of the containers in terms of either way the range here, which serves, as, which serves as an additional requirement on top of the operator, the first operator. And then somebody else might come and say, well, I want to use my own uh, op, uh, implementation of plus, or I want to use my own binary operator altogether. Again, we lift up and we have accumulate, passing in operator as an extra parameter. So we end up with this implementation. In this lifting process, we've gotten rid of a lot of repetitive code that actually can go in a multiplicative order. And we have this implementation and we can simply just reuse it for all those different functionalities, uh, like adding integers to the vectors or multiplying for equal numbers to the sets. Now, this is all that the user ever has to do. The rest of the job is done by the compiler. So, when the compiler passes an expression like that, it deduces the appropriate template arguments for the call expression checks those template arguments against the template parameters, 
and then proceeds to instantiate um, the well the the template if the checking succeeds. Essentially, it wants to put, it wants to generate a specialized implementation with respect to the arguments that we use. For most compilers nowadays, they actually don't go ahead and generate a code immediately right away. They simply generate a specialized code stub at the point of use. And the actual generation of the body of the implementation doesn't occur until much later in the process at the end of the transition unit. So, generic programming is supported in different languages in various capacities. There's this one paper from Jeremy Gibbons that I like very much, which has this classification of um, the different ways in which the ideas of generic programming apply to uh, different domains in PLs, foreign languages. So we have this idea of generic by value, which all of us actually know as function of function abstraction. Uh, he has generosity by type, function, structure, property, stage, and shape. When we talk about concepts, we are really looking at generosity by structure and property. So we want to be abstracting over the requirements and operations on types, as well as the properties on the types. So this is supported in C++ using templates. Yes? By property, do you mean semantics? Yes. Thank you. Which are not always expressible, but. <laughs> so um, coming back to the template example, there are some in these assumptions that we're making here, and which are actually to which corresponds to requirements that this algorithm that this algorithm has imposed on the types. So we're assuming that uh, not equal, the, well, these operators, you're assuming that they, are, they will be defined at the point of use and that their use is valid. We're also assuming that some of those operators are running in some <coughs> constant time. Um, another assumption is that the values of the input parameters can be copied and copy constructed. Now, there's only so much that we can do in terms of expressing those requirements explicitly, um, let's say, as additional parameters to our, um, to our template definition. Also, a lot of those requirements tend to always come in groups, and they can get repetitive from one algorithm to the other. So we need a way to group all these requirements together and express them more concisely. So that's what concepts help us to do. Um, so when a type actually matches the requirements that form a concept, we say that the type satisfies the requirements of the concept, or we say that the type is a model of the concept, or that the concept models the type. Yeah. Right? Type models the concept. Uh, no, it's actually. Uh, oh, wait, wait, wait. No, the type is a model of the concept, so the, mo the concept models the type. I think I'm pretty sure about that. No, we can double check here. Mm -hmm. Terminology. So, just putting this in concept terminology, um, essentially the requirements that the algorithm accumulate uh, imposed on, on its types here are that the type either would satisfy the requirements of an input iterator. The enough will satisfy the requirements of binary operator. And also equally as important is that the result, the type of the result of applying the BNOP operator is convertible to the type of the elements in the uh, container that we're working with. In the STL, these requirements are expressed as input iterator, binary function assignable. So concepts are an abstraction mechanism. They allow us to hope the requirements that generic components impose on their types, those requirements can be syntactic, as in the case of uh, the operators being defined. They can be semantic, as in the case of, um, say, the cost equality between the pre-increment uh, operator and the post-increment uh, operator. They can be complexity guarantees, as in the case of um, the operators being executed in constant time. Essentially, they allow us to express our brain in terms of the properties on the types rather than over, uh, in terms of their types. So they're essentially component generic programming. Some people like to think of them as constraints on types, others as um, type predicates. I'll let you decide whichever works best for you. Um, just remember that the aim of generic programming is to improve the reusability of software components, all the while, and um, all of that in an in efficient preser efficiency preserving and safe manner. In terms of efficiency preserving, we're looking at the, in, the, was the the instantiated, well, the specialized um, algorithm that we get from the compiler, and we want to make sure that we we haven't lost any efficiency with respect to the initial computer algorithm. 
in matters of safety, we want to make sure that the definition of our templates are checked separately from the use. And then when both checking succeed, there has to be a guarantee that instantiation will be successful. And that's separate type checking. Like generic programming, concepts are actually supported in various programming languages as well, in two different extents. So this is a study that was conducted by um, Garcia and Jeremiah, um, several other people from our group, back in 2005, 2007. Uh, what they did was they identified a number of features that um, together could constitute support for concepts in the language. They contrasted all those uh, features against different languages to see which is going to support those features. And we see here that, well, probably going to burst the bubble, but Haskell quickly supported all those features. <laughs> um, SML and OCaml OK were quite close. Um, I thought Java, C Sharp, C, well, they all support concepts to some extent, some more than others. C++ covered everything except for separate compilation. But C++ support also was very, uh, stood out from all the other languages in the sense that because of the flexibility that Swift allows, even though the, the features were not explicitly supported in the language, people could still program as if they were part of the language. So concepts have been part of Swift for a long time, and this is the development, development of the standard paper library. Uh, a lot of the libraries are implemented with concepts in mind. Uh, if you look at the STL or MTL or Boost, or, uh, yeah. So concepts are actually to find the documentation and algorithms are implemented with those concepts in mind. But they're not checked by the compiler. It's very customary for library developers to use what we call suggestive names. Um, like here, instead of using either like we did before, we use input either either the name of the concept directly or the name of the concept here binary function to indicate the requirements that we expect the use of generic component, that we expect the types to satisfy at the point of use of generic component. But we can also quickly see here that there's only so much that we can express using these suggestive names. Uh, for example, the additional requirement of the convertibility of the types of, of the result of application of data, um, it's not quite trivially expressible in this manner. Over the time, over the times, uh, library like have also come up with all sorts of idioms to aid in expressing and also checking these concepts to some extent. We've seen things like type threads, type dispatching, enable if, several other better programming techniques, and probably some that I'm not aware of. Um, the post concept ch checking library pushed the boundaries a little bit far out there using, using the preprocessor. But the point is that all these um, extended idioms, as useful as they were, had their limitation because they've all reached their limits. We already saw that suggestive names are not expressive enough, but the extended idioms also ended up being, in a lot of cases, too robust and complex for non-experts to study meaningful ways. But putting all, the, all those things aside, templates are just not separately type checked, which causes some problems uh, with our error detection and diagnosis mechanism. Those problems come in three flavors. Either um, they're detected very late into the process, or they are detected, but the error messages that we get are just incredibly uh, complex and lengthy. On top of that, they leak implementation detail to user space, something that is not always favorable. Worst case, we get semantic errors going undetected. So let's look at a small example here. We have our elements stored in a vector and they're of type void star. And we're trying to add them together using addition of integers. Now this is the error we get. It's not so bad. It's gotten better over the years. Um, here we have the indicator in our user code of where the error occurred from. And shortly after we have something here that tells us, well, anyone who understands basic type matching can understand that, okay, we need to replace void star there with int. So that's good. But even before we got this, we already had an indicator, a pointer to internal implementation. If I never wrote binary up, I might be confused as to why it is pointing to that. I don't know who to blame here. Is it the library implementer or is it me? Who is who, who, are, who are, I'm using? I don't know my English. Um, who is using the, 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 the algorithm? Now we take bind, we take plus, and we wrap a bind around it. 
it gets a little bit worse, but you still get our indicator coming a little bit down, um, a little bit further down. Here we have a lot of work just to implement your inter, um, internal implementations. We move away from accumulate altogether and you sort, and now we not only get two errors generated, we have a bunch we have lost um, the indicator in our code, it's coming much later because I don't know how far it reached down, but it's coming at some point. But before we reach there, we have a lot of pointers to internal implementation. That can be quite confusing. All that we really want this to tell us, we want that right off the bat, we want it to tell us the binary operator that we passed in is incompatible for the types of the elements in this, co in this collection. Let's take sort and pass not equal to um, as a binary operator. Even the STL already has documented that the binary operator that, that one passes in for sort must satisfy the symmetric requirements of strict weak ordering. And we all know that not equal to does not satisfy that requirement. But we plug this code in, compile, and it works just fine. We don't want that. So we want to be able to catch those cases. So uh, what am I doing here? OK. So ideally, we want to get something like this. And this is actually the error that we get with the current <coughs> flow, um, version of um, concept claim. Uh, right off the bat, we have the indicator in the code of where the problem occurred. And then the notes here are only pointing to the surface of the implementation and never looking at the internals. No matter how deeply nested this call is, this is pretty much what you can expect as an error message. Our semantic errors are also detected. Not equal to doesn't uh, compile. The compilation does succeed. So language support for concepts would improve the usability and safety of templates. Essentially simplifying our existing, uh, the existing practices and improving the error detection and diagnosis. But that would have to come at the price of some additional syntactic construct and also extended behavior of our compiler. Essentially, the compiler has to check the requirements now, uh, something that we call constraint satisfaction. In terms of extending our syntactic constructs, we start by extending template declarations with the requires clause, essentially specifying the constraints. Here, when we have something like this, we say, stated clearly which one of these template parameters, which one of these types must satisfy which concept. Alternatively, we can use these simplified forms and leaving the use of requires clauses only for more complex um, constraints. But in order to even parse this, we need a way to define concepts. So this is the definition of the integrator from the SGL, SGI STL documentation. And the concept must come with a name and a parameter over which it, it's acting. And then a number of requirements. The STL documentation has this notion of associated types, valid expressions, ex expression semantics, complete the guarantees as requirements, and several other types of requirements. Once we have that, in order to use a constraint template, we need a way, a mechanism by which we match types to concept, a modeling mechanism. So we need to say, this type matches this concept, and here is how it matches the concept. We do that by defining concept models. Um, so we can say something like int star is a model of input iterator in this case because essentially it has a notion of similar type. If we, I mean, such that the value type, the value of it is n, and for distance type, the value is pointer to dash t, whatever that is. Um, it satisfies the requirements of valid expressions because essentially after we perform the appropriate type substitutions over here, the expression that we get is valid. And the ideas can extend to other types of requirements. In the pre frankfurt syntax, this is more or less what we get. So we express associated types using template parameter declarations, and we express associated functions using uh, function declarations. Concept models um, were called concept maps in the pre design. And yeah. I'm sorry. On the previous slide, there were there were type names after the equal signs in it. Type names after what? After the equal signs. And I, I think that I think the concepts got rid of all the um, disambiguation. I don't know. I got this. I got this from uh, the initial uh, oh, okay. proposal. So. <coughs> sorry. All right. So. Um, we express concept models like this. In the preferred design, they use concept map uh, keyword. And they basically just reuse um, function declarations to provide implementations for certain functions. And for certain types, um, they would use like type def declarations to provide um, implementations for um, associated 
type templates, and then some, I think, template aliases for uh, social class templates. So, concepts can also refine other concepts, so basically extending the requirements of another concept. In this case, we can say input iterator is a refinement of trivial iterator. That means that if I'm going to state that insta is a model of input iterator, then I must make sure that insta is also a model of trivial iterator. Concept models can also be expressed in generic forms, so we have the notion of concept model templates. In preframe for notation, we get this as the full definition of the input iterator um, using the proposal. I mean, basically, the proposal ultimately. They have these notions of system of requirements here. We have refinements up there. And the system of requirements are essentially like refinements, ex except that they can also act on associated types. And here they're actually using the simplified form of, of specifying requirements to both specify an associated type and also specify the requirements on that, on that associated type. For concept model templates, they basically wrote it this way, so it's just like we will do with class templates or any other, any other template form. Um, we check refinements by just making sure that the model, appropriate models exist. So just to summarize, these are the elementary components of concepts design. So we have uh, concept definitions, concept models, which can be generic as well. Uh, we have constraints template definitions, which come with the notion of constraint specification. Constraints template use, we come with the notion of constraint satisfaction. Here we have requirements, and we have requirement satisfaction. Refinement, requirement satisfaction. That's more or less the terminology that's what going on from here. So to recap, concepts could requirements that generic components impose on their types. They are an essential component of genetic programming. The constraints on types, which should be checked by the compiler. And a language support for them could be useful to not just C++ developers, but also users. So we're now going to get into uh, what to consider when implementing concepts. Um, we're not going to, we're basically going to just overview this part. And we're also going to overview the design alternatives, which are the reasons why we have concept plan today to begin with. We're going to slowly dive into the details of concept plan. So to implement the um, concept definitions, we need to first be, be sure that we can parse declarations that define concepts. In the process of parsing, uh, we need to make sure that we can actually also find names inside the refinements. For example, something like reference here is nowhere to be found in this scope, but it is defined in the iterator concept. So we need to make sure that name lookup can find names inside the refinements. In the process, we also need to just make, to just make sure that the body is well formed against the uh, concept parameters. For concept models, uh, it's essentially the same idea except that uh, name lookup needs to find the names in the maps of the refinements or associated requirements if those are supported, as well as in the model concepts. After we're done parsing, we need to check the models against the model concept to make sure that every requirement that is specified in the, in the model must be satisfied by the model. Well, every requirement that is, that is specified in the concept is satisfied by the model, and every statement of satisfaction that we have in the model corresponds to a requirement in the concept. And we do the same thing for uh, refinements. Um, for constraints template definition, we want to make sure that we can parse the constraint specification. Here, there is this notion of constraints and variables associated with this parsing. Every time we parse a specified constraint, we add it to this constraints uh, environment. And then, to this constraint environment is associated this notion of restricted scope, which communicates to name lookup um, to actually find names inside the constraints environment as well. And then we need to check the value against the constraints. When we're using template, I mean, when we're using template uh, constraints templates, um, from the user's perspective, the work is the same as when we're using unconstrained templates. But from the compiler perspective, it means something else. It means we have to actually do, try to satisfy the constraints. That means finding the models for each one of the specified constraints that corresponds to the arguments at the point of use. And pass those models somehow to code generation so that instantiation can generate a specialized code appropriately. So basically we want to extend our type checking mechanism more or less this way. In addition to checking the arguments against the template parameter, we want to check them against the, constraint, the specified constraints as well. 
this whole checking process generates appropriate models like this for each one of those specified constraints that correspond to these arguments. And then, during code generation here, um, the, de the generation has to take these models into consideration. Essentially, uh, I hope this picture makes sense, but um, assume we have our constraints environment represented like that. It corresponds to a call, I mean, we have a call to full here that happens to be associated to a concept. That means that we're going to have some sort of declaration for full inside the constraints environment. So while we're parsing this and we're able to load names inside the constraint environment, we're going to find this declaration here. Now that declaration can be meaningless because it's just a placeholder for when we have uh, concrete information about the types. And in cessation time, we now have concrete models that were generated by constraint satisfaction. And we need to make sure that this pool now points to the appropriate implementation corresponding to this, to this declaration over here. <coughs> Kind of makes sense. So, to recap here, uh, the uh, implementation considerations in a nutshell, we have to consider parsing in these three different components. Name no must be modified um, in various ways. Um, we have constraint satisfaction here, which uh, also transfers the models to code generation, and we have this notion of entity reference we're building over here. We have to check the body against the constraints here. And we also have to check the models against the model concepts. Now, people have had differing ideas about how to design concepts for C++. Um, I've looked at some of those, and this is how I was able to classify the points in which they were different, the, these different ideas differed from one another. So we have these five main salient differences, I would call them that way. Requirements representation, so basically how to represent requirements was one point in which people have different, different ideas. Um, how to match types to concepts is another point in which they have different ideas. Um, how to represent requirements essentially uh, dictates how to satisfy requirements and also how to check the value of constraints templates against uh, the specifications. <coughs> there is also another point of difference that is based on how to represent and satisfy axioms. Usually when a design actually considers axiom, they just consider, they just parse it, but they don't check it. And usually at this point, they're only considering the kind of logical sentences that, that can be expressed, that one can express in the language. Um, for modeling mechanisms, the idea is eventually boiled down to whether we want to support implicit modeling mechanism or uh, explicit modeling mechanism. With implicit modeling mechanism, a user is not allowed to explicitly state match a type to a concept. Uh, but with explicit modeling mechanism, the user actually has to match to explicitly match a type to a concept. They do they state that this type is a model of this concept, and here is how. These two ideas kind of correspond to the notions of structural conformance and name conformance. With structural conformance, the matching of the type to the concept is done by the compiler. And at this point, most of the uh, checking, I mean, most of the checking essentially only looks at the syntactic components of the, co of, the, of the concept and barely looks at the semantic components. With name conformance, uh, one can argue that we can encode the uh, semantics in the name, and the compiler really just makes sure that the user has provided the appropriate model. For requirements representations, we have these notions of use patterns or the signatures. Depending on what we choose here, we have also these different choices here. So if I decide that I'm going to represent my requirements using use patterns, I'm probably most, most likely going to satisfy them by finding a valid expression, and I'm going to check the body of the constraints and definitions by uh, matching expression trees against use patterns. And if I choose the signatures, I'm going to collect valid candidates, and my checking here is going to be based on name lookup. I'm going to be um, sort of highlighting this. So. so now, use patterns, you can think of them as um, expressions that are serving as patterns for valid uses of declarations. So these are some examples of use patterns. This is what we are all familiar with, and these three are uh, what we added in the panel design. So essentially, in this case, we're saying 
given an expression exp and the type t, the type of we are explicitly stating that the type of exp can be explicitly convertible or implicitly convertible or be an exact match to the type 2t. With uh, star i plus plus over there, when we state that in a concept, we're basically saying that whenever this uh, concept is used somewhere, you know, I'm saying that whenever these operators are used, um, that the context in which they're used must match that pattern. When we're checking concept models, we have to satisfy these use patterns. And since we have concrete information about the types at that moment, um, after performing the appropriate type substitutions, we just want to make sure that the expression that we get is a valid expression. So we just want to find a valid expression for the use pattern. At this point, we pass an expression. It happens to be valid. And we just want to make sure that um, that expression corresponds to can match any of the use patterns in the concepts that um, are associated to our conscious environment. For pseudo-signatures, you can think of them as type signatures that are just like mock-ups for valid declarations. So, for associated types, like things expressed with type name T, it's relatively easy, there's only one possible match. But for associated functions, like in this case, there are several matches. Essentially, after type substitution, um, anything that is at least as CV qualified as the substituted copy, is a valid declaration. And also, uh, this extends to also supporting implicit parameters. Um, yeah, implicit parameters. To satisfy those uh, pseudo signatures, it's just a matter of collecting the valid candidates that correspond to uh, the pseudo signature. When we're checking the value constraints template in this case, <coughs> uh, you have to sort of look at it as we have name lookup already finding names inside the constraints environment. And after it finds the names, we have to check the, um, the related entity reference that actually triggered name lookup. If that checking succeeds, that constitutes our checking of the body. So, just to recap, and before everyone pulls it to um, we'll find many representations. We have choices between US panels and signatures, modeling mechanism, implicit or explicit modeling, requirement satisfaction by the expressions of other candidates. Checking the body, we have the matching expression trees, or we can base that on name lookup. For axioms, we just have to think about what kind of logical uh, sentences can we express. So, I put those against um, the um, some of the main uh, the proposed designs. One of the very first proposed designs uh, was eventually dubbed explicit concepts, and was based on using this explicit modeling mechanism to match types to concepts and using pseudo-signatures uh, to, start to, to to represent the requirements in the concept. And all the other things kind of fell um, from the description I gave earlier. So to satisfy requirements, we collect the valid candidates and cure it based on the lookup. That proposal did not give any consideration to axioms. And then there was implicit, con um, implicit concepts proposal that came along and was using um, implicit, was based on uh, implicit modeling mechanism and using use patterns and everything else following. Um, in the case of axioms, they actually wanted to support additional um, logical operators like implication and double implication. The preframe for design uh, claimed that what we do, preframe for design supported both explicit and implicit modeling and was um, more or less following the explicit concepts um, design. In the case of axioms, they only they didn't add any additional logical operator, but did use um, if statements in some cases. In the most recent Palo Alto design, well, the, the proposal itself has not addressed language mechanics yet. Uh, they were mostly concerned with a minimalistic approach to designing concepts, so they wanted to focus more on, say, what concepts are and how they can be used and kind of looking at the STL as a, as a starting guide for all the libraries. But uh, due to the fact that, um, due to the similarities that it has with implicit concepts, we can kind of we, um, start reasoning about how it could be implemented. So we've sort of just said that the design here is more or less based on um, implicit concepts proposal, 
but we've extended the use patterns with the type annotations. Now, the, these are not the only proposals out there. There are several other design idioms that are proposed. I've listed these two because they're the ones that I was able to find with concrete documentation of how they, could, they should work. Um, by the way, I have additional slides um, that are going to be available in the repository, so if you're interested, you can always look these up later. Um, the first one, name concept models, wants to add an additional name to our, def our description of concept models. Uh, this is supposed to help in resolving some hierarchy issues in the modeling um, hierarchy. Resolving some ambiguity issues in the modeling hierarchy. And then another proposal was to exploit this notion of axioms for compiled optimizations. And like I said, there are several others. <sighs> in trying to move from all these different designs to an abstract um, design, the concept play infrastructure requires that requirements be uh, represented as declarations. So in, in claim terminology, it basically means that whatever structure we use to represent uh, requirements, it must extend the class depo. We, uh, the infrastructure layer also supports both explicit and implicit concepts, and uh, collects valid candidates here, and um, the checking of the valid constraints template is based on name local and constraint environment. As we start moving from the infrastructure layer and extending that to the design specific implementations, the pre framework design more or less reduces everything from the infrastructure layer and only adds one kind of a declaration here. The Palo Alto design, which was actually interesting to find out, was it does more or less everything that is expected from the proposal, except that it does that in addition to what the infrastructure is already doing. Um, at this point, we've disabled explicit modeling, but here, because of the entirely new syntax that we're using, and new expressions, new declaration context, and all that stuff, we have uh, four kinds of uh, declarations that are added. So, um, I'm ready for the second part, and I think I can start with some questions if you have any, any questions. Or what? Is there anything that I can clarify some more? Can you go back one slide? Yes. So what are the four new kinds of um, the declaration of it was for the Palo Alto design? Well, the, so we have like dummy declarations that we're using. We need a declaration to represent use patterns. We need a declaration to, well, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be clear in a second. Okay. Okay. Yeah. This, was just, this was just a synopsis. Yeah. It's about ASP now. Yes. Yes. So are those declarations that go into concepts, go into templates? Just where, where, where are these declarations going? I'm sorry? Do you think kinds of declarations, are they going into the concept definitions? Are they going into template de definitions? Or yeah, uh, these going are going into the concept definitions. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's for requiring But they're part of the components. internal representation, right? You're not, you're not talking about declarations that the user necessarily sees. Um, no, it's internal, internal right. implementation. Right. Which is sufficient to fail. Oh, I'll start now, sorry. No, okay. There's an object called declaration. That's right. That's yeah. right. I'm kind of speaking plain. You have to forgive me. <laughs> um, and I hope I'm speaking in a way. Uh -huh. Any anything else? Any comment, questions? I think I have two more minutes to answer. Wasn't that clear? Yes. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead. So, um, so just to recap, our main goal here is to define the infrastructure layer. We want this to be independent from design alternatives. And we try to isolate our code from that of playing whenever we can. Uh, we're looking at pre-framework design and Palo Alto designs. And uh, we want to explore the implications of the C++ language by looking at the kind of extensions that we've made from playing implementation. We want to look at the uh, difference between alternatives by looking at the extensions that we've made from the infrastructure um, infrastructure layer. In this part of the talk, I'm going to sort of focus on the ongoing observations on, from these explorations, and I'm going to look at implementation details only as they're directly related to the results that we currently have here. And then later, just to give you an idea of how we go about making our implementations, this is to help those who would like to call the ideas to other compilers. Um, we're going to sort of travel from type checking density claim to type checking constraints density constant claim. So, concept plane has 
three main components, and these components were derived from the, the extensions we made from Play. Now, Play has about 17 subcomponents. It's my terminology is to call them subcomponents. I'm not sure what Play calls them. Uh, but um, we only extended four out of them. The AST uh, component holds book is um, the, the ST component is holds implementation related to representation of nodes in the AST. Basic holds representations of general data structures. It seems like things that are used all over the place. Parse uses uh, everything related to parsing, and SEMA uses everything related to semantic analysis. So that has basically derived all of our three components. We've also extended the driver component, but only for reasons of supporting compiler flags, so we don't have them there in the analysis. Now, getting to this picture, um, kind of like implementing the infrastructure layer and extending that to these design specific implementations, there were a number of procedures that uh, came into play here. But in order for me to present those procedures, I think it, it is essential that I at least spend some time talking about the essential data structures that we use. And then we're going to talk about how we parse and check these requirements, and also how we do uh, check the value of constraints and entry definitions. And then from there, we're going to dive into what the essential procedures are and how they relate to one another in both the infrastructure layer and the institution layer for both cases. So data structures. Naturally, we need at least a way to represent uh, declarations that define concepts as well as declarations that model concepts. Um, so we define these two classes. A concept declaration is a template declaration as well as declaration context. I mentioned earlier that, we requi that our requirements are expressed as declarations. So that kind of goes in hand with this being a declaration context. Instances of, of the concept declaration hold a set to all its models. The concept model declaration also holds, um, is a template declaration as well as declaration context, and also is uniquely identified for purposes of storage in the sets. Not that we're still stuck in the pre-referred terminology because we basically started this project before that, before I got to the model. So, just to give you a picture, this is, these are the classes that we extended from Plain. The grayed out classes are structures in Plain, so template declaration is a lambda which is a declaration. The concept declaration um, is extends these two classes, and we use the template parameters field to represent concept parameters. In parallel, the concept map declaration um, extends template declaration and declaration context, and in addition, it extends folding set nodes for purpose of unique identification. It will use the template parameters field for a different purpose in this case. Um, essentially, if the value of template parameters is different from zero, then the instance of the constant map deco is represents a constant model template. Okay, once we have all of that, um, we satisfy requirements by just collecting valid candidates. Now, this, like, this idea of collecting valid, valid candidates can apply to both use patterns and uh, pseudo signatures. Essentially, if I have this star i plus plus, the valid candidate will be every valid candidate for the cost to operate a star i plus plus. And if I have this use pattern, it is anything that corresponds to the call, uh, a valid call to foo. There's another special, another data structure that is that occurs every now and then, um, repetitively around the, you know, throughout concept claims It's called concept model archetype. These are essentially fake um, concept models with minimal information. We tend to use them as placeholders for concrete concept models. Instead of holding the valid candidates for each requirement. These actually only hold the substituted copies of the requirements. So if you had something like a concept like this with either a use pattern or, or use, uh, a use pattern here or a still signature as your requirement, the archetype would have essentially the same thing with the types substituted in respect to the types of the, 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 with the concept arguments. And that's what it holds. Speaking of using them as placeholders, we actually use them to represent our specified constraints. So whenever we parse constraint specifications, they'll parse into constant model archetypes. So our constraints environment, our constraints environment is, holds, holds a lot of constant model archetypes. It is a list of constant model archetypes. Um, 
the restricted scope is associated with the ambient parameter uh, declaration. So we actually make it so that the structures for the temperamental list and restricted scope all point to the same constraints environment. In clear terminology, that basically means that the class of scope and temperamental list share a point to the set of possible types that represent the constraints. So let's look at parsing and checking the requirements of in each concept. And we're going to start from the pre-Frankfurt design. In this case, um, <laughs> The requirements are all expressed in terms of declaration that already exist in C++. So at this point, it was very easy for us to just reuse claims, data structures, and procedures to uh, parse everything in, in the of checking. The system requirements were represented as, are represented as refinements. And because in this case, we need to be able to have several of those requirements in a single declaration, we created that one uh, class. That's the one kind of declaration that we've added. When we're checking constraints, uh, when we're checking concrete constant models, so satisfying the requirements, mm -hmm. uh, this is a three-stage name lookup process. So first, we look the name inside the current model. We can't find it. We look inside the surrounding scope. If we cannot find it, then we go inside the model concept to see if, it, if there is a, a different implementation that we can borrow from there. And if we can't find it, then uh, this is not this requirement is not satisfied, so the checking is going to fail. As soon as we're able to find it, we add the candidates into the current uh, constant model and we move on. For the substitution, which uh, is used when we're checking constant model archetypes, we simply had to reuse client There was nothing in between that we had to do. Looking at the Palo Alto design, um, we have new kinds of expressions we have new kinds of declaration context. We have a lot of, it's an entirely new syntax. Uh, first, we need to parse, uh, we, we decide to parse these patterns as expressions because of the similarities in the syntax. So we parse them as expressions, and then we have to extend the mechanism by which claim parse expressions in order to support these additional uh, syn uh, syn 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 um, syntactic constructions, for example. Now, because the infrastructure layer expects declarations and expressions are not declarations, we've had to create this class to essentially wrap expressions in to, and representing our use patterns. Now, parsing the use patterns here was a little bit tricky. Um, we had to consider, well, if I'm using expression parsing to parse that, it's going to expect that any name that I encounter is defined. But when we are in the context of the concept definition, we cannot expect that. We have to assume that declaration are not defined. So what we did was, basically go ahead and generate dummy declarations every time we encounter a name. So our name lookup process, in this case, generates dummy declarations for every name that is referred to. Like starting first this here. To check these was actually relatively simple. Type substituting um, the use patterns over and then checking to see if it corresponds to a valid expression. Now, in the process of type substituting the use patterns, at some point, because we had parsed all these named uh, names into dummy declarations, we're going to encounter them. We're going to have to actually replace them with valid uh, declarations. So there is a name lookup here. And this is also, we can do, the, do it at this point because we have concrete in, uh, complete information about the types. And we're checking concrete constant model. For substitutions, we just have to substitute dummy declarations over because we still don't have the information about the types. <coughs> now, this type substitution mechanism corresponds to the exact same procedure that uh, is used to generate specialized implementation. So we've actually, I mean, the way that we refer to this is that we're saying that um, the special treatment that we're giving to dummy declarations um, has led to an extension of our code generation uh, mechanism but not for reasons of instantiation, but only for reasons of checking the constant model. Now, uh, looking at the, the checking of the body against the, the body of templates against the, the specified constraints. For both pre frankfurt and Palo Alto, it starts from the same foundations. So a constraint environment hold constant model archetypes. Okay, we already have that pointed out. But name lookup here becomes a two-stage process. 
uh, interleaved two stage checking of entity references. I'm going to explain that. Basically, we have to consider in the body of a, cons of a, of a constraints template what kind of entity references can be encountered. You can think of entity references as a call expression, for example. Now, either these entities are going to be associated with some concepts, or they're going to happen to find in the template parameter that the restricted scope is associated to, <coughs> or they're going to be constraints that are defined from that are defined outside of the scope of the restricted uh, Well, that are defined in um, the parent scope of the outermost restricted scope from the point from where we're doing lookup. Or it's going to be um, ref uh, a non-dependent reference. So basically, when we're parsing this case, we encounter plus plus star not equal to the other to concepts, so we'll name lookup is going to find them just fine. But then when we come here and we parse uh, this expression, we're looking up plus, it's not going to find it. Why? Because our name lookup has already been modified here to only look things up inside the constraint environment and stop at that point. So when this fails, we have to let the compiler know that if it fails, it's not probably not because it is an invalid call expression, but it is because this actually corresponds to another constraint step that is defined in the outer scope, well, in the parent scope of the outer, of the outer most specific scope. So we basically repeat name lookup again from that level and then find plus and continue from there. So basically, we first look up inside the restricted scope. If we find something, we check the lead entity reference. If that succeeds, we're good. If that fails, we repeat name lookup from the other from, from, from the other scope and then check the entity reference again. Now, Palo Alto extends this um, first stage of name lookup with the fact that we actually have to mark every expression that we parse for validation. And then at the end of parsing a full expression, Depending on whether the sub-expressions had been marked before, we have to now check those expressions against the use patterns in the constant environment. Yes? So that's just an optimization, right? You could check them again and it wouldn't hurt, except for it would yeah, be slower. Well, but, yeah, but why would I want to check, it, check them again? I, I'm only try, I'm trying to reduce the way that I have to think about the problem to its essential elements. And so I want to ignore the, that problem if, if it's just a matter of you know, okay. Um, so, yeah. So we have to check it in because we actually refer to the expression validation at this point. Um, oh, where was that? Anyhow, so these are. <coughs> what's that? So these are all the essential procedures. Um, well, they're not all, but they are the ones that we need to use that I want to show you. We have a based on the elementary components that we have. We have name lookup in restricted scope that comes, this is the first stage of, uh, of name lookup in constraints environment, which comes in different flavors uh, in these three components. We have the parsing and the checking of the requirements and the refinements. We have the checking of a model against the model concept. Sometimes you might need to generate models for model templates. We have constraint satisfaction, which triggers concept model lookup. We have entity reference rebuilding. We have uh, constraint specification. Anyways, you get the idea. So. All of these are defined at the infrastructure layer except for expression validation because that one is particular to the Palo Alto design. Um, and they're also all implemented except that the implementation is parameterized over that of the parsing and the checking of the requirements which happens to be design specific. So I've put all of those in this. Okay, I was wondering if it was going to happen. Sorry. <laughs> Go Microsoft. I know. <laughs> I knew it was going to happen. So you really said nothing? Huh? No. No, I need to roll. Uh, oh, jeez, what did I just do? Sorry about that, guys. It's not my fault, I promise. No worries. <laughs> Happened to all of us. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, so we were here and we have done that, and now we were here. Boom. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> what? Boom. Last time it crashed. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I it was gonna oh God, I lost all of my colors. That's not really nice. So, um, these are just some of the uh, procedures, and this is related to semantic analysis component. So constraint satisfaction attempts to satisfy every specified constraint. And to satisfy a constraint, we have to do a model local. So we try to find a model. If we cannot find it, we try to find a model template. If we can't find it, we try to generate a model if it is applicable. Um, the generation of the model triggers uh, model checking, basically checking it, checking, checking it against the, the model concept. The checking of the model uh, involves checking the requirements as well as the requirements. Now, when we're checking the requirements, if the model happens to be an archetype, we just do substitution. And if it happens to be a concrete model, we actually satisfy the requirement. For the refinement, it's simply reducing constraint satisfaction. We come back here, if we had found a model template, in some cases we may want to actually generate a concrete model from that. So we go through this way now. I'm not going to get into the details of it because it's not related to the, the results that we have. But it suffices to uh, note that uh, there are two levels in which constraint satisfaction is reused here. And all of this is just happening at the, at the infrastructure layer. We haven't even touched the design specific uh, details yet. Instantiation, uh, the point of instantiation, we have to rebuild our entity references with respect to the models that they generate during constraint satisfaction. Putting this against our extensions with the quick paper design, the grayed out areas represent things that we didn't have to modify at all. All that we had to do here was provide implementations for substitution and satisfaction of the requirements and also whatever the requirements. Um, against the Palo Alto uh, extensions, since the user is not allowed to explicitly match types to concepts, and the only way to have model templates is if he was allowed to do that. This whole part kind of didn't play a part in this, and didn't really uh, play a big role. However, we did have to provide implementation for substitution and satisfaction of requirements here. But because of the, spe the special treatment we give to dummy declarations, we've actually had to extend the recording of entry references. Um, I don't know if you remember when I was saying that the substitutions uh, corresponds to code generation. So that's what happened there. But in addition to all of this, we also have to consider expression validation. I wasn't quite sure how to fit in this picture, but it is something that is added. Uh, you know, it's an added complexity that we have. So, just to kind of give you another, you know, contrasting those extensions against the implementations that are provided. Well, it is the uh, images that are provided at the infrastructure layer. These are the ones that we actually have to extend. The ones, the light gray ones are the ones that we didn't have to touch. I think you get the idea by now. I mean, we've already talked about these extended programming satisfaction. We've talked about the checking special trees <coughs> and trace validation. We talked about uh, this parsing and checking so and the, the, the generation of dummy declarations. For the pre for design, uh, we only had to look at the parsing and checking of requirements. Um, we treat the certain types here as standard parameters. That is actually something that um, Doug has expressed to me that he's not quite sure is, is the right approach, but I still haven't went into trouble with this, so I'm going to keep going until I hit my head over the wall. Um, so, now, just for reason of completeness, um, I'm not sure that, you know, these are necessarily going to make much sense, but um, I just wanted to highlight the differences that we, that we were able to kind of sort of put together. We, at this point, we're actually still in the testing phase of the implementation, so we, don't, we have yet to assign concrete meaning to, this, um, to these results. But I hope that at least just taking a look at it will give, will give us something to think about moving forward. So we have, due to the new syntax we have in Palo Alto, we actually can enter new scopes after the equal sign in addition to the purely voices. Not sure what that really means, but it's just something that we noted. Um, because we're treating associated types of standard parameters, we also have to consider the scope of the value of concept definitions that are standard parameter scopes. 
Now, whether these are actually important, uh, you know, good or bad things for for Queen Frankfurt, it still needs to be studied in contrast to what we get in Palo Alto, which are the extended expression parsing as well as the fact that we have to market expression for validation. And also, just for now, until we understand the implications of the use of our demi declarations paper, we're assuming that all the types are defined in the context of the national concept. So when we pass in these patterns, we assume that the types are defined, and we only generate them in the declarations for, for all the names other than types. So what yeah. types? Um, well, they have associated with, so the product design has these notions of associated type requirements. Mm -hmm. It's not associated types as in the, the <coughs> as in what we prefer, but it is type requirements, mm -hmm. and I'm not even sure how it's so it, it, can, it can be something like a type function. Mm -hmm. An instance of a type function, you just have to make sure that that type exists when you are checking the model. So, um, for in the data structure components, like I said, we have one additional class here, and we have four. One is representing our use patterns. The other one, dummy declarations. This one is representing what they call, what they call the requires clauses. This one here represents some dummy expression I had to generate. I forget why I had to do that, but it was in there somewhere. Um, but also, here we have to do with the fact that we're actually exp supporting explicit, uh, um, explicit concepts and concept of methods. The symmetric analysis component, we have found a lot of generate dummy declarations and also supporting concept overloading. Now, concept overloading is new to Palo Alto, and we haven't seen that before. It's different from, from concept-based overloading. It just allows us to provide different declarations for a given concept definition, the definition of it. We have to kind of look, in, look at these two here and kind of see how we can interpret these results. But to satisfy the requirements is we kind of have to make a choice between three-stage name lookup in the pre preference design versus type substitution, which involves one name lookup in here in the Palo Alto design. But we also have to keep in mind that these type substitutions um, comes in comes hand in hand with the extension of the standardization mechanism, whereas the three-stage name lookup here comes um, in hand with a special trimmer that we have to give to associative functions. Because satisfying associative functions is not is not so trivial. It actually has to be treated uh, specially. And then, no matter what those, uh, what we, what result we can get from these, uh, we also have to look at them in contrast to um, the fact that this one could support expression validations, whereas in this case, we actually can rebuild type uh, references during association. This one is not doing that yet because we are assuming that types are uh, defined in the context of constant definitions. And then we have extensions of the fact that we're doing explicit model mechanism here. There are two other changes that I had to make. Well, some sort of extensions that I found myself having to do in order to get the pre-Frankfurt uh, implementation going. So I basically just wanted these cases to work. And I looked at the standard, and I wasn't able to uh, see exactly what the standard said about that. So I had to make, a, I guess, a, an informed decision to allow the channel associated with type declarations, for example. So this was so that I can override the implementations from refined concepts in a given concept definition. And here, I wanted to just allow the, allow the definition of a default implementation of a concept of just provide implementations of concepts in concept models, whether this name corresponds to, uh, uh, corresponds to something that has been defined before in some respect. So just to give you an idea of the workload, and I'm sure that this is not the best way to measure the workload, but it was just to give you an idea. So we have about 120 functionalities implemented at the interstitial layer. Uh, that is uh, parameterized over 13 functionalities. And uh, down here we have 30 to 40 functionalities implemented. So we're now going to look at type checking templates playing and and uh, constraints that they cause the claim. Um, we're going to look at the uh, function called expressions for illustrations. So we're trying to go from this picture to this one here. Um, basically, we've seen this before, right? So we check the arguments against the constraint specifications as well. 
that generates some models, and those models are taken into account when we are uh, generating the specialized code. So just to make sure that we have our terminology intact, um, I said we can think of entity references as call expressions. When those references will depend on template parameters, we call them dependent entity references. So you can think of them as dependent call expression. And when they're not dependent on, on, on template parameters, they're not dependent entity references. So in the current example here, everything that we refer to, every, every uh, reference here is actually dependent. Why? Because you know, we have um, first and last, which the types are input either way, which happens to be template parameters. And we can extend the ideas to any and be not. And then, you know, their use is also dependent as a result of their types being dependent. In this uh, extended version, well, specialized form of accumulated by which we just abstracting over the containers. Um, in it and VNOP, no longer their types no longer depend on the parameters, so their uses here are non-dependent, whereas everything else is dependent. Now that is going to help me describe what happens when we type checking templates. So we get this. At the point of template definition, only the non-dependent component uh, entities of the body are checked. At the point of use, the arguments, the different arguments are checked against the template parameters. And at this point, we're basically just checking to see if they're well formed against the dependent parameters. It's not until code generation that the dependent <coughs> components are checked. And this is where we get a lot of, a lot of those uh, latent decision errors from. To check constraints, um, to extend with the check of constraints, we basically treat both dependent and non-dependent entity references as non-dependent. So everything gets checked during template definition. And then during template use, um, I said we check the arguments against the, speci the, the, the specified constraints. But um, during code generation, there is still room for some ambiguity. So we still do not quite have separate type checking with concepts. But we have gotten rid of a lot of problems already. Um, so, well, so we're trying to go from here to this one. So we're going to start here. Just to give you, this is just really implementation details at this point. Um, we look at the parser of template definitions, the parser of template uses, and the generation of special implementations. To do that, so this side is going to be listing the uh, parts of Clang that I've had to modify, well, the parts of Clang that correspond to the English over there. So this is Clang language, and that is English. So, our step the declaration invokes the parsing of the body, which invokes the parsing of the statements in the body, and which eventually calls the parsing of the expressions in each statement. The parsing of expressions in each statement coincides with the parsing of a template use. Now this can take different directions, so at some point we can parse a type reference or we can parse a call expression. Every time we parse one of those uh, references, we check them. Since we focus on call expressions, that's what we're going to be checking. To check a call expression, we have to make a decision uh, about what to do based on the type of call expression. If it happens to be a dependent call expression, like this, like the calls being up here, the checking is delayed. If it is a direct call expression, we return to the parse with the result result. And if it happens to be an overloaded um, call expression or an object, like in this case, um, we go to overload resolution. There are several ways in playing that we can go to overload resolution based on the type of overload expression. In this case, we're going to go to build overload call expression. Overload resolution mostly consists of two stages, two steps here. Uh, first, Based on the results from name lookup that we got uh, from the parsing uh, layer, um, we want to build some candidate sets. And then once we have that candidate set, we need to select the best variable candidate. Now, in building the candidate sets, for a given name lookup result, we need to put it to template argument deduction, which consists of first deducing the template arguments, and then checking the arguments against the template parameters. And then if that succeeds, we create a specialization that is returned, uh, that is added to the candidates. To create a specialization, it's really a matter of performing appropriate substitutions and then returning a new instance of the function method class. 
Now we come back and we are trying to see the best viable candidate. That again brings us to temporary reduction, but only for purposes of comparing the candidates. Once we have the best viable candidate, we mark it for instantiation and we turn to the parser with the result result. Now, so at this point, we finish parsing the definitions and parsing all the uses of our templates. <coughs> we are at the end of the transition unit and we're just trying to um, generate the special implementations. We start in um, instantiate function definition function. We use the body of a template as pattern for the body of the specialization. So we're basically going to go ahead and perform the substitutions going down the, 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 the trace, the AST. So substitute so statements in the body and then this transform the statements in the body. This is basically using plain terminology and then transforming entities in each statements. This part is a recursive process that attempts to transform every expression, statements, declarations, types, or entity that encounters, every entity, every entity that encounters in the way. The general idea is to sub substitute the components in each entity. If the entity happens to be a template, it also finds the appropriate specialization for it and returns either the specialized implementation or a rebuilt version of the entity with the substituted copies. I know there is a lot of information. Um, to transform the part expressions, we look at the sub expressions first. This constitute of uh, expressions representing the call E as well as the call arguments. And then once we have all those transformed, we can rebuild the call expression using those, the, those, uh, the, the result of those transformations. The rebuilding is essentially just checking the call expression again, which puts us to overlook resolution again, depending on the, depending, well, for things that were delayed before. <coughs> we can also just return the result result here. So, this is just a graphical representation of those comp the, the different components that came into play, and um, which one triggers which one. We have the specialization code stuff that was generated here serves as a prototype for um, the final special implementation. And we have the template definition serving as pattern for the generation of special ed code. For constraints template definitions, we've basically extended every single one of these components with the exception of the ones that are grayed out. So we're going to be looking at those. We extended basically, well, there is Passing constraints and definitions, checking that the are use. We're putting over the resolution for reduction because they're similar in some ways. And um, the generation of the specialized limitations. We extended the um, parsing of template definitions with the parsing of constraint specifications and also the two, st the two stage name the top that I was uh, mentioning before. These are essentially the uh, implementations and claims that I had to extend in order to make that happen. Our template uses, you just have to notice that we no longer have to worry about dependent entity references, so they're no longer delayed. And we get the two-stage two entity reference checking, which corresponds to the two-stage <coughs> lookup that we have during parsing. Here, we've extended, um, well, our template argument reduction with constraint satisfaction. Basically, now, after checking the template arguments, if that succeeds, we check the constraints. If that succeeds, then we generate them with the, the specialized uh, code stuff. And then we also extended the selection of the best viable candidate by essentially taking into account the constraints when we're comparing the candidates in the candidate set. For general sort of specialized implementation, we're basically doing this in two stages. So we're doing essentially everything that we would normally do before but we're also repeating that before with respect to the models. So, um, picture. Now, earlier I had this picture and this, we weren't really sure what things would look like in there. But now we know that our constraints environment holds constant model archetypes. And these are holding substituted copies of declarations inside the model concept. So, when we parse this, this full, the full that we have here is really a a fake, a fake declaration that really has no implementation. So it makes sense that at institution time, given that we now have concrete models corresponding to each one of those concept map archetypes over there, 
And we know that since the concrete models, we have full implementations for full. We want to make sure that this kind of expression that here was pointing to this fake declaration now points to a real implementation in the model. So that's it for extensions in there. Um, note that the check your template uses now happens twice. The first time it is as a result of two-stage name lookup here. The second time it is as a result of the fact that during entity reference we're building, we have to do it twice. Once with respect to the models found during constraint satisfaction, and two with respect to the existing specializations. So it's sort of like in that spirit that we implemented all of these uh, procedures and the other ones to come. So now we're almost done. Mm -hmm. um, these were just some observations that we made in general. Um, well, let me just say this. I wanted to be able to parse that. And um, the Palo Alto design actually supports that, that syntax. And concept playing, it's actually easier for us to support this syntax. But the preprint for design prohibits that and actually wants us to explicitly write it this way. Yeah, I can show you the clause, I promise. <laughs> was there a rationale? Or I do not just... know, but I suspect that it's probably because they were treating the notion of um, of a requirement specification separately from refinement. In other words, it's an accidental artifact of how they were doing the wording. I'm not oh, sure. In refinement. I thought it was a normal refinement. No, this no. is as a refinement. <laughs> Um, in this case, there was a, um, the clause said something like, okay, upon parsing a concept map, the name should be added to the scope in which the concept map is defined. So I interpret that as meaning, after parsing this, if I do name lookup at this point, I should be able to find this declaration in the listing of things in the results. Well, concept map does not, uh, concept claim does not support that. In concept claim, Name lookup cannot find concept maps. The only way to find a concept model is to go through um, the model concept. Um, whether this is going to come back and bite me later, I, I don't know, but I didn't really see a use for making them available to you um, for name lookup. If anything, it just complicates um, other name lookup mechanisms. And now, this is all happening again at the infrastructure layer. We have several other questions that are occurring at this layer too, which are actually still open questions, and if you have a good answer, I'll be happy to talk to you about that. So one is, is there a way to completely separate type check, to, to perform complete separate type checking? I don't know, it's an open question. Uh, how sh can we actually order the specializations with respect to constraints? Now this has to do with uh, some issue with concept-based overloading. In the, um, the slides that I've put up, uh, that that I've made available in the repository, I actually have concrete examples of these situations. So if you want to take a look at them and have a discussion, I'd be happy to um, do that. So, recap. We wanted to implement concepts for C++ in a more generic fashion. We have defined interface files with some interface classes. We wanted to define an abstract layer in a way that is extensible to alternative designs. Uh, those interfaces can be extended with respect to the team designs. That's actually what we've done for the previous and Palo Alto design. Uh, as far as the um, assessment of the, of the implications and the subtle differences um, between alternatives, uh, we're still working on that. Um, so, concepts are an essential component of genetic programming. They improve the safety of those templates. Concept plan implements those concepts. Uh, plan facilitates the process. Uh, it is independent from design alternatives as well as flexible to design alternatives. So, to answer the question, what design are you implementing? I say none at all in every design. Um, we want to highlight the subtle implications of, well, I mean, it highlights the implications of design alternatives and language mechanics and is still under development and undergoing testing. Thank you. Are you going to keep this as a fork, or are you interested in pushing this upstream? Uh, you mean making it completely part of playing? Yeah. I would like to eventually be able to do that, but you know, as of now, I just don't want to.
come up and then code based on how sure, sure, sure. Really, you know, But do you, do you have a feel for how that would be received by the rest of the client team? Um, well, so it really depends on the interest of Apple at the moment. Um, hmm. Sure, I can always implement as, like, as an extended compiler of lag in playing, but um, I, would, I would have to talk to Doug about that in, in greater detail. Okay. Yes? How large is the compilation overhead added by, by the features you implemented? Again, we have yet to do that. Um, there, one can, at, this, at this point, one can speculate one way or the other, right? I mean, there are areas in which you can say this is probably going to uh, make, um, this is probably going to worsen efficiency because we have to do so much name lookup. I mean, we modify name lookups that we can always look inside the restricted scope. And that involves a whole high concepts hierarchy to go through every time we have to do a lookup. Um, we have seen the three-stage name lookup to check to check uh, concept models and those things. So one can argue that okay, maybe this is going to be a uh, hindering performance. But at the same time, we have to say, well, we're also checking, we're also capturing um, errors earlier, and we're eliminating a lot of processing that would normally be happening before we capture the error. So I, I don't know. It's something that I still have to really look So in case of errors, it's faster, but in case of no error, it's slower. Uh, well, we don't know that yet. <laughs> okay. We don't know that. So one thing you can say. You can also say that because the Palo Alto design actually has really, really simplified a lot of concepts, mm -hmm. so we can say that, well, the overhead of doing name lookup is actually uh, not so expensive and it's worth, um, it, it's worth um, checking things earlier. Getting better error messages is always uh, uh, yeah. worth uh, investing yes. time. So the intent is the, is the intent when you are completely finished to then develop a set of test cases, essentially seen from the library developer's perspective, where you here's what it yeah. looks like um, one way, here's what it looks like with the Palo Alto way. What's the fallout from that? Yeah, so we actually have, we, the, the, we, all, we already have a number of libraries that we're going to be testing these things against um, with each design and, you know, those alternative options as well. And we're going to see what we can get from that. I mean, we're looking at the standard library, for example. We're going to, I mean, basically, a lot of the work that was already done to, our, uh, that was already done to testing Boston GCC, we're going to try and replicate that. And on top of it, we're also going to look at, um, well, the Bushcraft Library, for example, as a good example for things to test against. Um, the test cases in the EOP with the essentials of programming, we're also going to have to implement those to see, um, you know, if there is anything there that we missed. That, uh, well, just, just to see that it conforms to the expectations from the book as well. Okay, so then, then what kind of a, a time frame are we talking about? Are next year or are you <laughs> going to be here presenting that, the um, results? Or that, is that's a really good question. I've been saying soon. It's been like eight months now or something. <laughs> so I, I really, at this point, I'm not sure if I want to say soon again. Um, eight months is nothing. You're still very young. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> eight, months. Hey, eight months, that's fast. We only have we only hold BoostCon once a year, Boost, you know, C++ now once a year. So. Yeah, well, I also have to get some sleep in between. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, soon-ish. Yeah. So I know you've talked to Doug about some of uh, this. Have you talked to anyone else in the planning community? Not yet. I really haven't got to that point yet. Like right now, my main focus is on the testing. Once I have, I have that out of, the, out of the way, and I push it, and, and I push it out, I'm um, hoping to uh, get feedback from the community. So, so my specific question is, like, if you talk to them about the actual design itself, you get input from pe other people. Like, I know that Doug is, is, is you know, usually the most important person in the planning community. There are a lot of other people, and yeah. I think you would. Like, I, I'm a little bit worried that this much design and implementation work is going on with out broad community. Okay, input. yeah, you're, you're right, actually. I mean, it's, it's quite worrisome, and um, and I would like to be sure that I'm doing things the right way, right? I don't want to spend two years to find out that, oh, basically, that thing you're doing is completely worthless. It, it's more it's more about the open source nature, I think. I don't think it's about the right way or the wrong way. I think it's more about making sure that everyone is involved in the community. Exactly. Well, there was also the issue that you know I need to at least be able to make sure that I can really document what I'm doing. 
right? Um, I need to be able to make sure that I connect. I mean, I can't just come around and say, help me without telling you what to help me with, right? I, I need to have something concrete. Mm -hmm. sure. I need to be able to at least express what it is that I need help with. So, yeah. well, another, thing, another thing we should ask for help. Okay. Keep in mind. Okay. He just, he want, I, I think he wants you to make sure that, that the rest of the community is involved in the design discussion. Yeah. Now, I understand what a, what a problem that is for your particular situation because you, you have some particularly strong personalities to deal with already in the design discussion. <laughs> and any more, any more opinions that go in different directions is going to make it even harder. Yeah. Um, so no, no. so I, don't know whether that, I don't know whether that's practical, but I understand why he wants, wants you to do it. Yeah, I, I mean, I, those are, you know, that's a very valid point to make. And um, I'm really trying to do my best at uh, wiggling my way through So to, to specifically address that concern, because I think it's a really important one. Um, if, if there is a discussion in the open source community about this design, one thing that I think would help, and I would be willing to help a lot with this, is to open the discussion with extraordinarily firm ground rules. This is not a forum for discussion about the concepts, proposals, but a forum for discussion about a particular implementation strategy without any real consideration of like whether or not it comes into claim or not. That may be more dependent on the proposal and that kind of thing, but we can still talk about the technical details of if we are going to implement concepts on top of claim, how? Okay. Well, that certainly would have very little overlap with the other the other opinions that she has to deal with. So that's, that's good. the goal, right? Yeah. The goal is to kind of say, like, no, 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 and, and, and I'm willing to be very, very firm on mailing lists and such and these discussions to say, no, that's off topic. We, we're not debating that here. We're talking about implementation. Um, but I think getting that kind of broad feedback would be very important, and the sooner the better. I would not wait for testing. I mean, your presentation already has lots of interesting interesting things in it that I, I, I don't have all the code yet, I, I haven't looked through everything, but I think that lots of people in the community will already have relevant, helpful feedback that is only focused on implementation. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes. Uh, I, I think there was an earlier proposal from Jeremy C plus court concepts. Is uh, it transparent? Well, do you support this? <laughs> scope concepts, as in within uh, concepts that are defined in different namespaces. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that is that is kind is of like for free supported here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Actually, the context of so the, the the declaration context of a concept actually uh, well the context under which a concept map is declared is part of the parameters that uniquely identify a concept map from the other. Well, yes. My understanding was that you don't have any explicit concept maps, and so that there is no explicit. The infrastructure record. layer supports explicit concept maps. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, I, were you you were not talking about the Palo Alto design just now? You were just talking about the infrastructure. Yes. Understood. Mm -hmm. Yeah. questions so when you. Uh, in, in the pre frankfurt design, when you actually generate the concept map for an auto concept, when you automatically generate, do you actually generate the concept map decal and link it to the concept map, uh, to the concept decal? Yeah, I mean, generate it and then because after generating I have yeah. access to the defined concept, I just add it to yeah. the set of models that, um, the set of models that the concept is necessarily given. Are we happy? So. <laughs> <laughs>